build trust and follow through with what you say you're going to do. Let your yes be yes and your no be no. I think a lot of the time that gets kind of skipped over in the sense that it's like, hey, man, we're going we gonna to do this. We're going we gonna to really put our all into it. And it's like you get three days in you're like, ah, I don't really see this working. You know mm-hmm. what I mean? Stick to it. Do what you say you're going to do. And and allow that trust to be built, especially with the community that you build around you. Because that's a huge thing, especially from a management perspective. If you don't have the trust of the people that you work with, it's very hard to lead. Because as, as the tour manager, a lot of responsibility inadvertently falls on my shoulders because I'm the management on the road. So when we leave and we're on the road, it is my job to then lead these guys. And so if they can't trust that I'm going to do what I'm what I what I said I'm going to do, inadvertently they lose trust in a leadership and then that's when things start to crumble from the inside out. Ladies and gentlemen, welcome back to the Rooted in Christ podcast. My name is Eric Stevens. I'm the founder of Redwood Christian Ministries. Hope everyone out there is doing well today. With me on the show today, my brother in Christ, tour manager, Bailey Unterwagner. Sir, how are you doing? I'm doing great. Doing great. Back at home, get some rest in. So I'm doing well. Doing well. You've been on tour since I met you. <laughs> <laughs> it seems like. You ain't, you ain't wrong. Bro, I swear, I don't think you've been home since we met. And that was in like November. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. It started in August, bro. Uh, went on the beautiful tour. With, with Hovey, August and September. Um, and then November followed up with support with Cray. And then went back out for an for artist named Hade in January. And then the beautiful Tour West just finished up in March. So, yeah, back to back. Bro, when you when you hit me up and said you were home and you were like, we can do the show, I'm like, let's make this happen. Because I've, I've been wanting to get you on here for a minute now. So, like, I'm glad we could finally get this to, to work out. So, um, I know that you're like, we just, we talked about you being on tour, but who exactly are you a tour manager for? So my main client is Hovey. Um, that's my brother, known him forever. Me and him are, are two peas in a pod, man. Um, him, I work with no big deal. I'll do a few other one-offs here and there. Um, I've worked with the artist named Hade and D singer before, um, and a few others. So mainly Hovey and, and no big deal. The beautiful tour. If you didn't get a chance to check it out, man, that was some. That was something special. And I, I say was because the Cleveland show happened happened already. So <laughs> there you go. Um, yeah, bro, that that thing was like you felt the spirit in there though. It's like I've not been to. I mean, I went to a lot of concerts before I got saved, but there there was nothing like like you felt the spirit of God in the House of Blues that night. And I've seen a lot of clips and reels from like the the, the tour like around the United States. It's crazy. Like you get emotional just watching it, man. It's it's something special. You ain't wrong. I appreciate that. That statement alone, you can feel the spirit in the House of Blues. That was that was the goal. You know what I mean? This kind of encapsulates the goal for the tour. It was just even though it was a little bit non-traditional for a Christian tour to be in a place like the House of Blues. That was kind of the intention. You know what I mean? It was to take it somewhere where the spirit, it, it can be, but it traditionally isn't. You know what I mean? Where where a lot of the, the bands that perform typically aren't doing what we're doing. And so that was kind of the intention behind the tour was taking it into places that, that really need it. You know what I mean? Holy says it best himself. He says the doctor's looking for the ones that know they're sick. You know what I'm saying? So we try to, we try to take it there. So that was the goal. I need to take the gospel beyond the four walls of the church, right? And realize I am the church. So I'm going to take this everywhere that I go. I'm going to, I'm going to take the great commission with me everywhere that, that I go, right? Like I'm going to, exactly. and that doesn't matter whether it's at the house of blues, whether it's at the grocery store, whether it's at the barbershop, that's for you, not me. Um, you know, wherever, wherever yeah. we're taking it, like wherever we're going, we're already going somewhere. So I, I'm gonna be making sure that I'm representing Jesus where I'm I'm take where I'm going. Right, right. Cause that's the that's the part is that we go to the church. You know what I mean? And so we go, we gonna take this thing throughout our daily life. You know what I mean? Like you said, wherever we go, that's that's the that's the great commission. That's the goal. So before we really dive into like like the, the tour manager piece and like what you what you really do, like behind the scenes, I think that's important just for the audience here, because I haven't had somebody on the show who can share your perspective. So I really want to hear like what that really looks like, but talk a little bit about just your background, your testimony, like what your, your what your journey with God has, has been like. 
For sure. I got uh I got baptized when I was 21 or right before I turned 21 in July. Um really I, I'm from Roanoke, Virginia. I was born I was born in North Georgia, moved up to Roanoke when I was two. Um Roanoke, Virginia, southwest part of Virginia. Um was living there until I was about 14. Um and that's from two to fourteen was it was a rough point for me because I felt like a lot of the influence that, that was in my life wasn't I was raised in the church, but it wasn't the influence that I had on my life wasn't what I would call walking with God. It's not actually having a relationship with God. It was like, I know about church and I know about God and I'm in church, but I'm not, I don't have a relationship with God. I'm not walking with God. And so because my relationship with God wasn't, wasn't there all the way, I had a lot of influences from the outside come in that a lot of it still sticks with me to this day, but um, the influences they were they were rough at such a young age, you know what I mean. And so I moved to Brunswick, Georgia, when I was fourteen, and I've been here ever since. And uh, this this is the place that I'll truthfully say I met God and I and I walked with God. Um, and then, like I said, I, in, in summer of twenty twenty one is when I officially got baptized and really dedicated my life to Christ. And so, ever since then, I've just pursued what He's put on my heart, and that's gotten me here. So. So how, how are you using like right now, like your, your platform, your, your profession to really bring, bring God like honor right now? Like how, how are you doing that in, in your day-to-day? In my day-to-day life, with, which is if, if we're talking about my work aspect, mm-hmm. how I would say is that when we go places, we try our best to show people that at the end of the day, the, the figures that people look up to, especially in Christian music, that we're all just people. We we try to make sure that everybody is fully aware that Jesus Christ died for you just as much as he did for this person. Wow. You know what I mean? And we really want to put that into perspective for people that there's no, I understand there's celebrity that comes with it, but Hovey or, or myself or Tori Deshaun or Big Breeze and Not Clyde or whoever it was on stage, they are, you and you and them are just as important. Jesus Christ died and came for you just as much as he came for them. And we want to show them that we want to bring the spirit there and show them that what a real relationship with Jesus Christ walking with him on a day-to-day basis looks like not to know about God, but to know God. It's something that Hovey quotes a lot is John 17, three, this is eternal life for that. You would know God and Jesus Christ whom he has sent, you know, and that's a, that's a, a verse that's very close to him. And as we've discussed it, it's, it's, I mean, it's a beautiful verse when you really look at it because it's not having a relationship and knowing about God and being, being cordial with God, but it's really saying, hey, let's walk. Like, let me know you. Let's have a relationship. And so that way throughout my life, wherever I go, I can take this with me and show people the light, you know? We should. I'm going to back up, actually, because that that is incredible because I want to – I want to tap into like how important it really is to keep honoring God with that, with that platform, because with that, with that success, you know, it's even more critical that we remember, like, this is how we got here. But for someone who who is listening right now, like, how do you even get into the field and the profession that you're, that you're in right now? Like, how does someone become a tour manager and working with somebody like Holby, for example? The, the first thing that comes to mind for me is finding an artist that you, as a, as someone on the business side, finding an artist that you not only not only trust, not only enjoy, but also you want to be able to look out for them as a person. So like Holy the artist exists here. Chris, the person exists here. They are one. And so as a tour manager, really as any sort of manager, you've really got to know that this role, as much as it is management, it's also brotherhood. It's also making sure that you're looking out for Chris as much as you are Hovey. You know what I mean? And so for an aspiring tour manager, really it's finding an artist that you believe in, that you can look out for them as a person more than you will them as an artist. And when doing so, you'll find your career to do well as long as you're following God with what he's called you to do. Um, there's really no step-by-step guide. I was mm-hmm. talking about this with a, with a, with a mentor of mine and, um, there's really no step-by-step guide. Everybody's everybody's journey into music is completely different, mm. especially on the management side. There's just not, there's not a proven uh, stepping stones that you can take, but following God's voice into what he's called you to do 
and and finding an artist that you can build with and say, hey, we're in this thing. Let's do it together. We're going to rock. That's probably the easiest way I can say, like, if you really just try to go entry level, get in the door, that's the best thing you could do. So to really be able to, to, to deal with the artist and the person, as you said, Hovey, and then you said, Chris, so how did that relationship mm -hmm. come about to where he was able to put that kind of trust in you for you to even be in a position to do what you just described? This was something that's been brewing since before we were born. Mm. So this is, it's a, it's a, I'm, I'm about to get into the history of this. So, <laughs> so his grandma and my parents when I was a, when I was young and in Dahlonega, Georgia, I was born in Dahlonega, moved from it, moved from North Georgia when I was two. Um, so my parents and his grandma was going to the same church, mm. and we moved when I was two. Like I said, to Virginia, they moved to South Georgia. Chris's family. So when we moved from Roanoke to Brunswick, my my parents posted on Facebook like, "Hey, you know, me and the family were moving down to Brunswick. Anybody that we know or that we should link up with." And his grandma commented on my mom's Facebook post and was like, oh, Bonnie and the kids, blah, blah, Chris's parents live in Brunswick. And so we was like, oh, cool. So we, we were like, oh, yeah, we'll make an effort to link up, whatever. We we just went to a random church a few days later, just picked a church, um, ended up at the same church as them. They were sitting in the row behind us. And sure enough, his mom taps my mom on the shoulder, hey, blah, 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 oh. And then so they, they, they met each other. His family introduced his, theirs to mine, and sure enough, we kicked it off. So it wasn't really like a, it wasn't as it wasn't really like a God thing. How we just kind of crossed paths. It was really like God ordained, like from the '90s, like relationships that were brewing in North Georgia that ended up coming all the way back around to us meeting in, in Brunswick to the point now where me and him have such a close relationship that it's just been ordained. You know what I mean? This is it's been deeper than music ever since we met. We met at church 14, 15 years old. And, and ever since we just, we got along as best friends and then showed me his music. And I was like, Hey, I want to help whatever way I can. I'm not musical whatsoever, but I want to help. You know what I mean? <laughs> so that's how this trust came to be is that we just knew God ordained this. It's been something that was, that's been set in motion since before we were, before we were born, you know? So. Man, that is, that is incredible. Well, thanks for, thanks for sharing. That is like crazy background. Sure. It's, it's like, yeah, I know it's, I know it's mad context, but I had to explain. You know no, that I mean? is, that's perfect. Bro. Cause like, I think God is in all the details, right? Like you just, it didn't just mm -hmm. wake up and it's just like happened by happenstance. Like God is in the, the detail. This was, this was his plan. You know what I mean? So that was, then I'm, I'm glad you exactly. shared that. So thank you. For sure. Yeah. So how, what has it been like now? So you're, you obviously just got off tour and I know you got some other big things coming up in June. I'm going to let you share what, what that is, but so what goes into being a tour manager and working with some of these artists? So what does your like day-to-day -day look like as far as like the quote unquote office? So when I'm home, as far as the setup of, of, you know, putting together a tour, um, it looks different for every camp depending on the artist management. Um, but at least in our sphere on the, on the Hovey side, I work with his managers which are two guys from Rise Up Artists and Richard Gandy and Jay Kirkpatrick. I work hand in hand with them and uh, Morgan Carney from WME, um, Hobie's booking agent. And as things, as the venues get booked and all the uh, crew gets solidified, we'll basically start advancing the tour. At least the, the first part that I handle is advancing the tour. So I'll reach out to all the buyers um, and advance all the general information, make sure, um, our project manager, AC, he'll, I'll loop him in and he, he handles all of our production details. Um, and we basically just get everything set up so that way when we show up the day of the show, we're not looking around wondering where we're supposed to be, what time we need to be where we, we have a schedule that way our crew knows where to be at what time that way we can move in an efficient manner. Um, and yeah, so, I mean, it goes everything from, you know, making sure that we settle the show correctly to making sure that the schedule looks right to making sure the guys know what they're eating for, for lunch you know, everything from the time you wake up to the time you lay your head on the pillow is organized by a guy like me who makes sure that your day to day looks, it looks clean and you can move in an efficient manner. Because I also think that honoring people's time is very important, especially in the space where Christian touring has been behind for a while now. And I want to make sure that we have a, we have a good rep. So honoring people's time and making sure we move in an efficient and in a professional manner, you know what I mean? So 
there really is no consistent day-to-day schedule. Um, it's just following up with emails, making sure everybody knows where they're supposed to be, making sure we have all of our uh, bases taken care of regarding merch, schedule, settlement, all those things. So, so I I travel for for a living for for work, and I'm really ready for that to calm down. <laughs> so, <laughs> hey, uh, amen, amen. I honestly like. The idea of just sleeping on airplanes, sitting straight up is like no longer appealing to me. Like it was like when you're young, it's like, oh, this was nice. This is fun. I get a trolley place. It's like, man, I just want to stay home. But so. Yeah. I, I told someone the other day, I went 365 days in the house. I want one full year of just sleeping at my, in my own bed. That's what I want. People, I have a hard time explaining to people like when I, oh, when you on vacation, like, what do you do? I'm like, I stay home. <laughs> I sleep. I sleep. Yeah. Like my dream vacation is my house. (laughs) No, literally, literally. It's funny enough. That's, that's so true. That is so true. Like I miss my bike, my place. Like, can I just stay home, please? Like, is this okay? (laughs) Yeah. The idea of traveling for a living is, it's, it sounds so appealing when you first get into it. You're like, man, I get to go to these places. Don't get me wrong. As beautiful as it is, you get to see the world. It's a, it's a, one heck of an opportunity and I recommend it to everybody if you get the chance. But after so many, after so long, I, I was tell, I was talking to my, uh, our project manager, AC, Anthony Carballo, great guy. I was talking to him the other day and it's like three weeks is just kind of my, my cap. You know what I mean? After I'm on the road for three weeks, I'm like, you know what? I'm ready to, I'm ready to get back in my bed. You know what I mean? Anything underneath three weeks, I can make it work. We can make it shake, but that three week mark, when you're gone from the house for more than three weeks, you ain't been in your bed twenty something days. You ain't seen the gym in a while. You're just ready to get back home and just kind of get that get that quality rest in your own bed. You know. I learned how to live out of a bag, and you're better than me because two weeks is my max. I'm like, I know, right, yeah. I need to get out of here. This is crazy. What mm-hmm. is what is that really like from like a, a family standpoint or relationship standpoint? Like how would and what advice would you give to somebody who's like trying to to manage and navigate those those waters that you're going to be in and out like that and possibly out longer than in? Yeah, yeah. Uh, luckily, me and my me and my fiance, which June first, she'll be my wife. You know what I'm saying? So praise God. But me and me and her have a relatively um, unique scenario. Um, we sh- she functions best when she's able to. She's able to knock out things that she wanted to do, um, like clean, organized. She works full time as a choreographer, and um, so she's she's a she's a very busy woman. Um, she's a very type A type person. She's very list driven, task oriented. So when I leave for three weeks, obviously less than ideal. As much as she would love me here, she's able to get things done in a, in a very timely manner in her head. That way, when she comes back, she feels like, oh man, I've had all this time and clean the house, take care of this, take care of that. That way when we come back home, we can enjoy enjoy each other's presence. You know what I mean? And so it's a unique scenario, um, but being out on the road, the biggest thing that you can have is clear and concise communication. And even if that means not texting, but making an effort to hop on the phone two or three times a day, that way what she is saying, I can tell what type of tone she's saying it with. That way our communication doesn't get misconstrued. Because mm-hmm. if we're only communicating you know, a few times a day over text, we can't really afford to, to misunderstand each other. You know what I mean? And so, yeah, I mean, just making sure that you have clear, concise communication in the sense that, you know, you don't really get to speak to them much. So you want to make sure the times that you do, you can capitalize on it and make sure that, you know, they she can hear your heart, you can hear hers or vice versa. So it's a communication thing. No, you're spot on, bro. I make it a point when I'm traveling, I, to, to, talk to holly as soon as i get to the hotel at night like that is that is like yep. a, a must the hardest part for me is keeping up the time zone sometimes i'm like oh crap I'm like i'll call you at 10 and i'm like oh it's 11 <laughs> you know, what I mean? I'm like, yep. you know yep. what I mean? like just try to remember that and keep that straight sometimes it gets rough for me like a little bit you think you think i would know by now as often i've been, I've been doing it but i still mess that up from I time feel to that. I messed that up. <laughs> Fact. the worst is east to west it's only three hours but that three hours makes one heck of a difference Cause it's say it's 10, 10, 10 p.m. on the West Coast. That's one a.m. back home. You know what I'm saying? She could she in bed by eleven fifteen. She oh. been going to she been asleep. You know what I mean? Yeah. 
Oh, bro, Holly's ideal bedtime is like 10 p.m. Like, this is what I'm saying. Like, yeah, you know yeah. what I'm saying? Like, it's like it's a wrap. Like, it's like, <laughs> yeah, yeah. The worst for me yeah. is the east to the south because you'll hit parts of Texas and it's just like, wait a minute, hold up. This is this is still central. Like, you know what I mean? Like, it's just, yeah, yeah. Texas is its own, Texas is its own country, bro. Texas yes. is so big. It's like eight hours east to west or something crazy. Like, it's that big. Like, Texas is different, bro. Texas is different. I have a I have an ongoing uh not argument debate with with, a, with a, one of my homeboys, Johnny, Johnny goes hard. Oh he, yeah. Uh, <laughs> he uh he's from Texas. He's the embodiment, the physical embodiment of Texas is Johnny Goes Hard. Like if you want to find Texas put into one person, it's him. It's him. It's him. Yeah, for sure. And we have this ongoing debate that Texas ain't the South. Because we we, what we've settled on, long story short, is that Texas is its own entity. Texas is its own. Texas is Texas. But the South is like Mississippi all the way up to like Tennessee over to like South Carolina. You know what I'm saying? Florida's also in the same crowd as Texas. Like it's its own entity. Florida ain't the South. Mm-hmm. You know what I mean? But like that's, that's – Texas is its own thing, man. Texas is its own entity, bro. So I actually so ASAP preach is in is in is in Texas. And like I've stopped making fun of the Dallas Cowboys so much in this podcast. I have so many <laughs> connections in Dallas that like I don't want to get ran out of that joint because I go there a lot. <laughs> yeah. 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 But to leave bro, if you've ever left like any hotel in Dallas to go back to the airport, just put your GPS on, right? It'll yeah. tell you you're at the airport and then you have like like eight more miles to go. Like there's a toll to get in and out of the Dallas airport. Just give you an idea how mass this is. No. And Florida is definitely yeah. not the South. Florida is not South. No. Florida is Florida, which are alligators. Florida's closer to the Caribbean, stuff. bro. Yeah. Yeah. You might as well be in the Caribbean in Florida. Like it's closer to the Caribbean than it is like Southern culture. Like when I'm talking about, I mean, I'm from South Georgia. So like yeah. people that don't know South Georgia, Brunswick is like the Southeast corner like I'm clo- I'm 30 minutes from the Florida line. So this culture is like South Georgia, Southern culture. As soon as you cross into Florida, you know. Yeah. You can feel it in the air. You know you're in Florida. So like it's a very different, it's a very different environment. You know what I'm saying? Florida's not not the South. <laughs> it's in the South, but it ain't the South. It's you know what I'm South. saying? I don't view, I don't view it's it's too uh commuter now. More people have just moved there mm-hmm. from all over. So I don't I don't view it as Southern, but I digress. Yep. I digress. I'm having yep. too much fun with this interview. Yep. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. So I do want to talk a little bit about, like, especially like the the Christian hip hop industry, like, because I've had a lot of artists on here, and I ask a lot of them the same question because only you guys can kind of answer some of these questions because you're you're in that space. So, how have sure. you seen, like, even you want to say gospel rap or or Christian rap, whatever? Guy, you know, I don't view those two things the same sometimes. So. What exactly, sure. how have you seen that evolve for, for the better over, over the years? Um, the space as a whole, I'm trying to think if I should say this, I had a conversation with a, with a, a prominent artist in the space in 2021, if I'm not mistaken, maybe 2022. And what was said to me was that Christian hip hop has hit its peak and we are on the way down. And that was a few years ago. So that's what was said to me. And I strongly disagreed because I think, especially now, the space is in a better place than it's ever been. And I'll stand by that. Sure, we haven't had the commercial success like, you know, Lecrae winning the Grammys, but like we haven't had that amongst the young crowds yet. But the fact that I think we could probably name five to 10 artists right now who are at a higher peak than what would be average 10 years ago. We have guys on, on social media and this kind of goes into the difference between like CHH and gospel rap, but like yeah. young Chris, I mean, dudes at 640 something thousand Instagram followers, miles minute, multiple hundred thousand. I mean, Alex G Caleb Gordon, Hovey, like you could start naming them off left and right. And these are, this is a situation that even five years ago, we didn't have this, we didn't have this scenario. You know what I mean? 
it's partially involved in in the growth of TikTok, but also Instagram Reels and and just how it looks like to have an online community and an online fan base, um, which I'll get into in a little bit if we have time. But there's a difference yeah. between fans and followers. Yeah, and so as much as there's a difference there, this is still our space is still put into a position where we have more advantages than we did five years ago. And so I do think that from a, from a standpoint, as far as the commerciality of Christian hip hop, sure. We haven't had um, the substantial success of like a Grammy winner or a number one album or any of those things. But I do think that the potential is there. And I do think the space is more popular than it's ever been as a whole, just between the di- the diversity of, of West Coast Christian hip hop, Christian R and B, uh, Atlanta Christian hip hop, like One K Few. I mean, you got guys from I'm um, MTM Isaiah up in New York. Like you have the Detroit Christian rap with DKG. Like you have all these different artists from all over the country, and even overseas with Limo Blaze and and all. The, it's like this whole space is so much bigger, and it, we've cast a wider net in the past five years than I think we've ever cast especially to a young generation who's searching for stuff like this. And so I think in the past five years, we we've, we've cast a much wider net than we ever have. And I think that that is how we'll eventually end up reaching the masses is that our net's going to be so wide. It's just going to be really up to how we, how we steward the people that we, we then have in the net, you know? So. I don't know if it's just because I'm in the space now with, with the podcast that I, I 100% agree with you because I'm watching closely. I'm watching Christian artists sell out shows all over the United States. And we have to ask her if you're, if you're really doing it for the Lord, then whether I have a Grammy or not, like I have to do this, whether I have one follower and cause I want to get into the idea of the fans and followers thing as you just talked about, cause you're, you're spot on whether I have one person following me, would you still do this? Or if I have, Two million people follow me. Would you still do this? And would you still give all that credit to to Jesus? So the idea is to do it, and you touched on it unto Him. And right, I, I think I think that there is so much, and we I think in in you need that variety because you and I we just we we were jokingly and lightheartedly talking about travel, but everywhere that we go, there's a different there's a different culture. You know what I mean? Like a lot of times when I'm doing like guest speaking. You know, I I will do what they can. They call it exegesis. Like you're supposed to do it of the word. Like when you break on the Bible, put it back together, and you explain it to people in a way they can understand it when you're speaking and teaching to them. But I do that with my audiences too. So the sound in the West is not going to be the same sound in Texas, and it's not to say the sound in the West isn't going to you know isn't going to jump in Texas. It's just Texas is Texas, Atlanta is Atlanta, New York is New York. Detroit is Detroit. I'm just yes. Yeah, some quick examples of just the culture is different, and some of those, and that does that does matter. So I think the more variety that we have out there, and not just variety, like God talent, God anointed variety out there is is a really good change. I think I think there's more of that out there than it was. I would say 14 years ago when I gave my life to Christ. Oh, for sure, especially with with how easy it is to now find and access. You know what I mean just the difference between being able to pick up my phone likelihood is I can't guarantee a likelihood is I pull up Instagram right now, nine, nine times out of 10, I'm going to see a Christian artist posting on Instagram. You know what I mean? And so that's the the difference is that we have now been able to cast such a wide net that regardless of where you're at in the country, you can find something that appeals to you. I was, I was like, I was, I was at the barbershop today and I was talking to my boy and I was like, Hey man, like even this, the difference in, in cultures and like you said, in California, Texas, all these different places is that as much as they are different, they each have their own, um, almost like subdivision of things that, that especially musically that appeal to them. You know what I mean? Miles Minnick, you can hear him from a mile away. You know um, exactly where he's from. Don't yeah. got to ask no questions. Yep. He's going to tell you where he's from first <laughs> right. off, but you can hear it. You know what I mean? And so, but those are the things that make each place unique. And so that's why I say, even though we haven't had the number one album, you know what I'm saying, or a Grammy or whatever the case may be, I do think that in the span of past five, 10 years, we've now gotten to a place where, We've probably, and I can't, I don't have the metrics, but if I'm willing to bet, 
we've cast such a wide net now that this next generation coming up isn't gonna have a choice. They're gonna they're gonna hear Christian hip hop or Christian R and B or gospel rap or whatever it is everywhere they go. And that's the goal. You know what I mean? That's the goal is to just give them something that they can digest that's actually good for them. You know what I mean? Especially when you have multiple different tours. Like I see the obviously just because of proximity, the beautiful tour, but then the pray tour, then Miles Minute going on tour, the gospel, or the Christian, welcome to Christian R&B tour that just got announced. Like yeah. all these different things, Caleb Gordon going on tour, all these, all these artists that are now hitting the road and doing so in a very, from the, from the world standpoint is a very successful way. When you see these rooms packed out with hundreds, if not thousands of people, every night you can't help but wonder how in the world are we not in a better space what do you mean by that you know what i mean and so when i was told that we were on the down slope it almost it kind of like threw my head back a little bit and i was like it kind of made me it made me wonder how tapped in people really were you right. know what i mean and so anyways yeah you see these shows selling out i mean across the country from all these different artists and and you wonder how in the world are we not in a better place than what we were you know what i mean so just my personal my personal standpoint no i mean there's there's numbers behind what you're what you're saying so i think music in general is so different there you can you can record a song now and not have to be in a studio standing right next to each other you know what i'm saying like we're yeah you know what i mean like getting music over to people to to get a verse from someone is not the same process that it that it used to be you know what I mean? Like you don't have to sell X, Y, Z amount of CDs like, like people used to like it. The whole process of the music industry is, is just different today. And I think social media has made, this is one of those things where I'm like, this is what the internet can be used for, for, for something positive. So yeah, what, go ahead and break down the, what do you, if, some, if I said to you fans and followers or fans versus followers, go ahead and, and, and tap into that. I think it goes, uh, the way I explain it is upside down triangle. And so I've, I've used this analogy with in a few different conversations, but it goes the the top, the biggest, the biggest section here is followers. And these are people that will passively follow you and give you just enough attention to, to, to be used as a metric. You know mm -hmm. what I mean? And so this is the very, this is the entry level is here. And then when it gets smaller is when you now have, you take them from uh, followers down to fans. And so these are people that will actually digest your music, comment on your post, maybe share it to their story. These are fans that will consume your music in a way that you can now see these are, this is how many people I have actively listening, watching, digesting my content. Mm. And then from there they go from, so it's followers, fans and then you have super fans which is the smallest subdivision here and so the difference between a follower and a super fan is i'm passively following you i want to keep up with what you're doing to now saying hey i'm buying tickets to your tour and i'm going on the vip meet and greet i can't wait to meet you and so it's a big difference going from the top of the triangle saying hey i'm willing to follow you on instagram versus hey i'm willing to pay for a vip ticket with my hard-earned money because that's something that like I don't I don't think it's talked about enough is as much as we go on tour for every ticket we sell that's harder money that someone worked for that mm -hmm. they're now spending to come see you perform especially the VIP fans who are saying hey I'm willing to pay extra just to come see you face to face and so that's a that's a super fan to me and I know there's levels to super fans I mean there's there's people that will, that will fly across the country to come see you. But at the end of the day, I feel like as soon as you were willing to say, hey, here's my hard earned money that I went to work for for several hours to then give it over to us and say, hey, I'm willing to come see you perform. That's a super fan to me because that's a that's hard earned money. You're spending hours at work to make this money that you're willing to hand over to us. And so that's the difference between someone that's willing to keep up as a follower versus someone that's willing to listen to your music as a fan versus someone that's willing to come see you perform as a super fan. And so there's very, very different things. And so just because you have followers doesn't necessarily mean you have fans or super fans. And then I see people all the time where, especially in like the college circuit, you'll see people that have tons of super fans 
but their Instagram, they have like 40, 50,000 Instagram followers. And you're like, how in the world did they just sell out a 2000 person room? But then when you think about it, it's just because just because you have super fans may not mean you have followers just because you have followers may not mean you have super fans. And so it's, that's the, that's the dynamic of, of that is that it's, it's two very different things between having followers and having fans, two very different things. I, I, I'm going to personally speak to your passion behind that. Cause I haven't known you for, for very long, but everything that you just described, as far as like somebody giving their hard earned money to come see someone perform live. Like I see everything you just said that you guys put in the beautiful tour. And I thank mm-hmm. you for that because for me, I have used a lot of, it's not a lot, it's all. I have taken my favorite artists like Hovey and, and, and Breno, for example, and they have helped me not listen to secular music anymore. Like they, mm-hmm. they have really put, they, they really made a, a stamp in my journey with God to say, I have an alternative because I love rap music. I have always loved hip hop music. And when I first got saved, I was like, what the heck am I supposed to listen to now? Because Ain't none of these cats Christian. <laughs> like, yeah, one of them. yeah. And yeah. it's not an attack on some of the the worship music I was out, but I'm like, I'm not, I I can't, I'm not at a point now as I was just like 14 years ago again, where I'm gonna put this on in my house and just listen to it. I'm not here yet. So that's when I came across Lecrae. That's when I came across Andy mm-hmm. Mineo. And you fast forward today to the two people I just mentioned when I mentioned Holy and Breno. I'm like, this is this has been one of those put off and put on like I put off something secular that was toxic and poison and I'm putting on something I can listen to with somebody's grandmother. You know what I mean? With my mom in the car, with someone's parents in the car, with someone's children in the car. And I use as a tool at the gym for ministry all the time. When I walk in a gym and I hear these dudes bumping trap music and I know that they're from the suburbs. I know that you've never experienced this in your life. I know that you, you don't know what it's like to be shot at. You've never held a gun. Let me give you something else to listen to that you can actually talk about that is actually going to give life right. to you. So I I really want to vouch for the heart that you just put behind everything you said, because I, I firmly believe it is there. I appreciate that. I appreciate that, bro. That's something that we never want to lose, lose sight of is that no matter, regardless of how many tickets we sell for each ticket that sold is the, is a, the exact same amount of people that have said, Hey, I've worked for this. I'm handing this over to you and I trust that you're going to steward this well. And so that's something that's the heart that we never want to lose coming into this, regardless if we sell five tickets or, or 500 or 5,000 tickets at the end of the day, it's all the same. You know what I mean? It's kind of like what you said. It's like, even if you have one person listening or or a thousand people or whatever it is, at the end of the day, if God calls you to say, Hey, I'm calling you to do this for the one person that's going to watch, would you still do it? You know what I mean? This is something that I don't know, I keep mentioning them, but this is something that, that Hobie mentioned back in the day was when he was working in grocery stores, someone approached him with the with the question is like, what if this is where God had you? What if God called you to Atlanta to work in this grocery store and scrub this toilet? Like, what if this was the reason he called you up here? It's like, you think it's music, but it's like, what if God was like, no, 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 no. That, I just use that to be able to get you up here. This is your calling. You're supposed to be in this grocery store. He was like, would you still, would you still listen and follow God? the same way that you are following music. You know what I mean? When it's a, it's a heavy question because you think, yeah, I would do it. But then it's like, no, God's calling you to spend your life doing this. Would you still be passionate about it? It's a very big question, you know? And so that's the, that's the passion that we, we try to have is that the, at the end of the day, music, this is just a tool for us to be able to use to then go spread the gospel. Mm-hmm. If God shut this down today, we're still going to go spread the gospel. We just use this as a vehicle to be able to do so. This is a very efficient vehicle for us to be able to get 500, 1,000, 2,000 people in a room and be able to say, hey, y'all, here's the gospel. You know what I mean? Like, this is just our vehicle. We're just using this to get as many people in front of us for then Chris to be able to say, hey, y'all, glory to the Father. You know what I mean? Like, he actually walks off stage at the end of this performance. As you saw, he'll leave the stage and then leave worship because it's not about him being on the stage it's about God speaking through him being on the stage and so he'll literally leave the stage and leave and leave worship because at the end of the day it's not it's not Hovey's show you know what I'm saying this is not this is not for us you know what I'm saying man that's Um, fire before we get to the last segment of the show the let him know segment I just want to give you a chance to drop any more wisdom or knowledge you have so 
what would you say to someone who is either trying to get into the the industry and the business to help uh to either do tour manager or even to do music and then follow it up what advice would you give to someone who's already in that christian hip-hop hip-hop scene to honor god with their platform for someone that's trying to get in um build trust and follow through with what you say you're gonna do let your yes be yes and you know be no i think a lot of the time that gets kind of skipped over in the sense that it's like, hey man, we're gonna we gonna do this. We're gonna we're gonna really put our all into it. And it's like you get three days in, you're like, ah, I don't really see this working. You know mm -hmm. what I mean? Stick to it, do what you say you're gonna do, and and allow that trust to be built, especially with the community that you build around you. Because that's a huge thing, especially from a management perspective. If you don't have the trust of the people that you work with, it's very hard to lead. Cause as as the tour manager, a lot of responsibility inadvertently falls on my shoulders because I'm the management on the road. So when we leave and we're on the road, it is my job to then lead these guys. And so if they can't trust that I'm going to do what I'm, what I, what I said I'm going to do inadvertently, they lose trust in a leadership. And then that's when things start to crumble from the inside out. And so from a management perspective, if, if if there's anyone that wants to get into management, tour management, artist management, business management, whatever it is, just understand you have to have the trust of the people that you work most closely with. You have to. It's a necessity. Um, and then for any artist getting in the Christian space, build a community and build it so closely knit that you can build for each follower that you have, you've now build it to where you can and you can pull them in in the sense that as soon as they become a follower, you've built, you've pulled them in close enough to them then when they become a fan, they don't feel like a fan. They feel like family. You mm -hmm. know what I mean? And so build cl a closely knit. And obviously I'm only speaking from, from proximity. I'm not an artist. I'm just close to a lot. But when I, what I see that works best is when you build a community of people that don't feel like, Oh, we're all fans of you, but it's it's like no, I actually, you actually care about me as a person. That tends to be what works best. Be genuine and don't fall into the trends and traps of like, oh, this is popping right now. Somebody try this. Just be genuine. Be yourself. People will like it if they like it, and the people that come along, let them be family. You know what I mean? Bring them in, care for them, and, and actually return the favor for fans that actually look out for you. You know what I mean? Because without without fans, without people, without the people that buy tickets to come to these shows, none of us have a career. None of us have a job. So, yeah, bring them in, make them family, and be genuine. That's so good. Brother, thank you so much for being on here today. This brings to the final sure. segment of the show. This is our Let Them Know segment. This is where you can share anything you like with the audience. My brother, please let them know. Just anything? Anything, man. Anything with a reason. <laughs> oh, Lord. Yeah, yeah, for sure, for sure. Um, let them know. I don't. I can't speak on the topic too much, but just for the sake of it, uh, finally starting to get the ball rolling on this subject, I'm here to say it first, and I'm going to say it loud and clear so this doesn't get misconstrued. Hovey's album. Hovey's next album is a certified classic. Okay. I'm setting the bar for a reason. I'm letting them know for a reason. Very clear, cannot be misconstrued. The spirit is in the album. Mm. The spirit is in each song and the spirit is in each moment. The sonics of this album are something that our space has not seen. And I'm fully confident in the fact that this album is a classic saying that loud and clear so it cannot be misconstrued so that is my that is my let them know i'm very confident in this this next album that he has rolling out very very confident don't be shocked if this is a clip that i end up using <laughs> I, i'm sure i'm sure i'm sure i'm sure but i want to stand by everything that i just said there so you go when That's this thing up. sees the light of day can't say i lied to you i can't wait i can't wait for that i'm excited i'm excited yes sir Bro, would you mind praying this out before we get out of here? Let's do it. Let's do it. All right, Lord, we just come before you today. We wanted to uh, thank you for brotherhood. Thank you for genuine relationships, Lord. 
Um, I pray that you look out for everybody that's watching this, Lord. I pray that you pray peace over them. I pray that you give them um, a sense of a sense of peace and a sense of um, a sense of letting them know that you are there for them, Lord. Um, no matter what they're going through, no matter how stressful that time may be in their life, Lord, that you're there with them. Um, and that you would surround everybody in here with good community. Um, Lord, I thank you for my brother here, Eric, that is, is spearheading this podcast, Lord. Um, I pray blessings over him. I pray blessings over his family, Lord. Um, and we just thank you for thank you for this brotherhood. So in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. And Lord, I just want to thank you for my brother Bailey right now, Father. I pray your 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 blessings and your favor over his upcoming wedding, Father. I just speak forth everything is gonna gonna go well. I just thank you as the, as the two become one, Lord. I thank you that you're at the center of their relationship, Father. I pray that you just continue to expand, uh, expand their territories, Lord. Continue to knit their hearts together, draw them closer, closer to you, and and draw them closer to each other, Father. But I pray, um, just just some restful sleep and just peaceful sleep with my brother as he as as he's back home, Lord. I just pray you to continue to expand his his creativity and just expand his reach, Father. I thank you for the divine appointments you're about to send his way. And I thank you that he's going to be someone else's divine appointment, Father. So I thank you for the blessing he's already been to my life. And I just thank you for everyone who is tuning in and, and listening to this podcast, Lord. I just thank you that everyone listening took something from this, Lord. We give you all the credit, all the honor, all the praise, and the glory. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. In Jesus' name, amen. Thank you for having me, bro. Thank you. If you have been enjoying our content, please like, follow, share, and subscribe to the Rooted in Christ podcast. We are on all major podcast platforms. Our YouTube channel is Redwood Christian Ministries. Please help us get the get the message out if you are enjoying what you've been listening to. My brother, thank you so much for being on the show and get you back on here soon. Most definitely. Can't wait.